Good morning, Council. Good morning. May it please the Court. Uh, Dana Curhan for uh, Gerald Porges. With me is uh, Joseph Cataldo. Um, we contend that the uh, Superior Court lacks subject matter jurisdiction over the indictment where some or all of the counts uh, covered events or offenses uh, allegedly committed when the uh, defendant was uh, under the age of 14. On uh, two occasions, this Mr. Court- Mr. can I ask you, I mean, the legislature can do what the Commonwealth says they did here, can't they? They can do that, sure. But I think the, I, I think the effect was, uh, there, there's a gap that this court's recognized on two occasions. And I think what they did, the Commonwealth contends closed the gap, and we contend did not close the gap. Why didn't it? I mean, it really seems to have absolutely closed the gap. I mean, it's, it's, it's odd, for sure. And one could say, geez, it's not a really sensible thing to do, but isn't that exactly what they've done? Well, I mean, what, what they did, what they, did they, they did two things to 72A. Um, they um, took out the reference to, well, they, they did two things. They, they took out the reference to sections, uh, I think it's 53 to 63, and. 61, I think. 52 to 61. It was 50, 53 to 63. 63. 63. Which included 61. Right, and, and what they did was they also repealed 61, but they didn't just <coughs> wipe out all of the language. What they did was they took the, the relevant language from 61 and moved it into 54. Right. So, yeah. what does Section 72A do? I mean, what, 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 how could it work? Well, how it, how it works is that it, it says that if, uh, if an offense is committed before the age of 17 and the defendant isn't indicted until after, or charges aren't brought or he isn't apprehended until after the age of 18, he can, certain things can happen, including transfer to superior court. Uh, what the, but I, I think you have to read sections, uh, I think it's 52 to 84 together as a single statutory scheme. And there are sections, there are about five sections that refer to that specific language, uh, 52 to 84. And when you do that, you, you what you get is, I, I mean, I, I think what the Commonwealth is looking for is 52 to 84 may exist as this uh, scheme for addressing juvenile offenders, but 72A stands on its own. It doesn't reference anything, any of the other sections. It doesn't uh, follow any of the requirements of the other sections. And I think 54 is pretty important because one thing it says is you can't, uh, bring uh, juvenile charges against somebody under the age of seven. Uh, the other thing it does is it says that um, it has that limitation of you can only, uh, of, of um, ages 14 to 17 that was previously in section 61. So, so do you agree that if, if uh, some, uh, a person between the ages of 14 and 17 commits a, uh, an armed robbery yes. uh, while masked, uh, and then uh, is not apprehended until he's 25 years old, could, uh, under Section 72A, could that person be indicted? Absolutely. But if he committed the, uh, the armed robbery while mask while under the age of 14, at age, say at age 13, that's he, right. he could not. That's right. And that, that, that's, both, that's contained in Section 54. 54 contains limitations on what you can do. So, so you're suggesting we have to read the limitations of 54 into 72, even though it doesn't say. Is that right? Yes, because and, and there is other language in various sections in 52 to 84 that talks about 52 to 84 inclusive. Uh, so, they so, talk about it as yeah. a single scheme. So, so you're saying I take it that um, you don't have a problem. Um, with, with Section 72A, so long as it only allows the Commonwealth to do what it could do to a person under the age of 17. That's right. So, well, well, how do you uh, interpret the fact that they removed the reference to Sections 52 to 84 in 72A? Well, they removed the, la the references to, it, to 53 to 63. Um, I don't know if I can read anything into that other than the fact that some of those sections no longer exist. For example, 61 no longer exists. 
And there is now language in some of the other sections referring to 52 to 84. When you, I, I mean, I, I think you can, I, I don't think you can say that 72A is not part of the scheme running from 52 to 84A, that juvenile uh, justice scheme, or, or is only for certain purposes uh, not part of, of, of that scheme. I think there are, again, there are like or above five, four or five statutes that specifically reference those sections. I mean, I guess what's confusing about that, though, is what 72A is really dealing with somebody who cannot be part of the juvenile system anymore, because it's, it, it's, it's, it's talking about somebody who's apprehended after they're 18 or 18 and above, correct? Well, I, 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 I'm not sure. I think they may be able to be addressed in the juvenile system. Uh, oh, it, okay. But, 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 there's, but there's obviously provision for them not to be. There is a provision for them not to be. Right. So my question is, I know you say, well, there's these references to 52 to 84 in various sections. Can you give me an example where somehow 72A, if you accept the Commonwealth's interpretation, makes a problem in some other section because it's referring to 72A? Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, I think, it render, I think it renders paragraph 3, the former section 61, I think it renders that meaningless in 54. It, it gives you a real problem with, with that section because what does it now mean that somebody, if, if you take the age limitations set 14 to 17, what does that mean now? That doesn't mean anything. Uh, there's also, also in section... Unless you aren't apprehended until after you're 18. Uh, possibly, but uh, there's also the, the limitation on prosecuting somebody under the age of 17 would not seem to apply under uh, 72A. Yeah. So. And, and I take it that um, the, the injustice, if you will, that you're, you're highlighting is that if a, if a kid 13 years old had committed an armed robbery while masked, uh, he could not have been treated as an adult if he had been apprehended before his 17th birthday. That's correct. Uh, in fact, if, if, if he had been apprehended when he was 16 years old and 10 months, um, he could not have been treated as an adult. But if he was apprehended when he was 19, all of a sudden he can be. That's correct. And, and again, that may, may be odd, uh, but in Commonwealth versus a juvenile, I mean, the court pointed right to that cross-reference and saying because of that cross-reference, there is a gap. Uh, and therefore, someone who commits a serious crime at 13 uh, and who's arrested after 18 essentially escapes all possible punishment. And that's something the legislature needs to fix. And that's what they've done here, haven't they? I mean, it well, may not I, be I a great I fix. I don't, think they, I don't think they have. And I don't think they intended to fix it. I mean, this is six years after a juvenile that this amendment took place. And the amendment was not very good. There's, I mean, this court has held that when you, when you want to confer or expand the jurisdiction of a court, you do so with explicit language. If uh, there was some language in there saying, and by the way, the Superior Court now has jurisdiction to cover this circumstances, I would, I, I would not be here. You don't think that language that it shall hereafter proceed according to the usual course of criminal proceedings? I'm sorry? Um, there's a reference to the usual course of criminal proceedings rather than delinquency. doesn't do that. I, 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 don't th I don't think that does that. I, I, don't think that it, I don't think that was intended to apply to this circumstance. And, and I, I, I think getting back to Justice Cordy's question, the cross-references, uh, the 53 to 63, uh, I would suggest that that is now contained in other statutes, that there are, again, four or five references in statutes referring to 52 to 84 inclusive. Uh, where is the, how, how do you take 72A out of that? How do you, it doesn't say 52 to 84 excluding 72A. I, I don't think, uh, the legislature needs to fix it, and I don't think they have, and I don't think they intended to. Uh, unless there are any further questions, I will uh, leave the remaining points to the briefs. Thank you, Thank you. Counsel. Thank you.
Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court, Alexei Tomasco for the Commonwealth. Um, I'd like to take a brief moment to um, provide some clarity for a point uh, that eluded me for some time and just talk about the two doors of the juvenile court. Uh, if we look at the original statute, certain juveniles were excluded from the juvenile court, so those individuals who faced a, a, a crime with a potential sentence of um, a capital crime or a life sentence crime. Uh, and this is eventually what happened with Metcalf, and I think that's one of the three cases we deal with, where uh, a juvenile was sent to the superior court for a capital crime, and by pleading down, he was sent back to the juvenile court. But there are also three back doors to the juvenile court, and the first was six, section 61. And I would suggest strongly that that's distinct from the third paragraph of section 54. Section 61 is an equitable exit where, due to the nature of the crime, the prosecution requests that the juvenile be treated as an adult, uh, as opposed to section 54, in which um, the uh, juvenile stays in the juvenile system, but is subject to a But section factor. 61 did have an age range, didn't it? Yes, Your Honor, it did. And it did since 1906, it, it included that and, range. And, and the age range was 14 to 17? Yes, Your Honor. So even under section 61, if a 13-year-old had committed a, a serious offense, they couldn't be the subject for transfer waiver, right? Y yes, Your Honor. But again, that's an equitable statute as opposed to what we're dealing with now. And I think that's an important distinction. Um, the other two statutes that we deal with are Section 72A, which is a bit of an odd statute inherently because it's a clawback. Um, and this uh, was the result of D'Urbano that says once someone's aged out, if you don't apprehend them for the first time. Is, the there, any, is there any legislative history? I understand that that one of the cases was in 1990 and this is 1996, but is there anything in the legislative history of the 96 amendments to 72A that suggests, yes, we're trying to deal with the gap that the Supreme Judicial Court has pointed out? Uh, Your Honor, I think uh, unlike the 1948 amendments where I think the legislature went in very explicitly as to why they're doing that, um, my casual observations is the legislature is backed down from giving reasons and, and my memory is that no. Yes, Your Honor. Um, what, what prompted the legislative changes? Do we know that? Well, I, I mean, I, I would certainly suggest that they pretty uh, routinely followed the decisions of this court, that when you saw Metcalf and then D. Urbano and then the 1990 a Juvenile, the legislature kept coming back and trying to do it. I think D. Urbano certainly dealt with the 14 to 17 um, fix in terms of Section 72A, and D. Urbano, like a juvenile, talked about the 13-year-old. The legislature didn't get it right for the first time, and, and therefore a juvenile in 1990. Or yes. the 13-year-old situation, they just decided uh, to punt. Uh, that could be, Your Honor. And I think when we're looking at the pre-1996 statute, um, by incorporating the juvenile statute, section um, 53 through 63, I, I, I think a reasonable argument can be made that they did want these individuals treated as juveniles after the fact. Uh, and but of course, the problem is they, in, in some respects, um, that particular individual is treated much more harshly um, um, as, a, as an adult than he would have been as a 13-year-old. Uh, well, Your Honor, I think this court addressed that in Bosque, and that wasn't discussing the intersection of 61 and 72A, but this court said it would be irrational to conclude that the legislature sought to require the juvenile court to derm determine such things as whether an adult defendant is subject to rehabilitation as a juvenile. And I think that's exactly what we're dealing with, is that when we're looking at the juvenile system and we're looking at Section 53, which incidentally does not apply to 72A, it only applies 52 to 63. But when we're talking about the juvenile system, it's a non-criminal system, and it's designed to really provide a special method of rehabilitation to individuals, and I think out of the sense that they can correct their life. That notion of rehabilitation, while it does apply to sentencing for the purposes of adults, I think is not the only consideration. And the, the statement is that you, you can't put a 21 or a 22-year-old into DYS. They're an adult at this point in time. So the issue, uh, I, I think Davis in the appeals court summarized it, it well, is that this is an issue whether there can be any punishment at all. Uh, and that goes to one of the, um, uh, the uh, argument about in statutory interpretation as, opposed, as to an absurd result, that under the defendant's scheme, um, any case, a 72A for any uh, complaint that could be filed in the district court, regardless of the age of the juvenile between 7 and 17, that individual could be transferred to seven, 
to the district court because the delinquency complaint could file against all of them. Whereas the more serious crimes where final jurisdiction only lay in the superior court, only those individuals 14 to 17 could be transferred to the superior court. For, so for some reason... Explain that to me again. I really didn't understand that in your brief. So you have a 13-year-old charged with a, an offense on which there is jurisdiction in both the superior court and the district court. This goes to Justice Gantz's question, or it may have been your question, Your Honor, which um, the, the question was, and the defendant concedes, that if an individual is between 14 and 17... So he's 23. This, let's talk about this sure. person. 23. 23 commits a crime between 14 and 17. That's a crime. When he was between 14 and 17, he yeah. committed a crime, and that crime is an armed mass robbery was the example. Sure. The defendant concedes that if he's first apprehended when he's 22 or 23, the 72A can apply. Can be indicted. Prosecuted. He can be indicted. Yeah. Um, the defendant's argument is based on Section 54, which says a youthful offender indictment can only be brought against an individual who's 14 to 17. In contrast, if we're dealing with a complaint, which could be brought under 72A, we have a 23-year-old who assaulted someone, a simple assault <laughs> instead of armed mass robbery, Delinquency can apply to any individual between the ages of 7 and 17. So hypothetically, you don't have this 14 to 17-year-old age limit. So any person in that age to whom they committed a, um, a misdemeanor, that person could be transferred under 72A. So this leaves a sort of weird gap under the defendant's argument that we're going to treat uh, 7 to 14-year-olds differently if they commit a felony instead of a misdemeanor. And I think that's... So, t so explain this to me again. I'm sorry. I'm very dense. So there's a 23-year-old, and he's now charged with assault and battery committed at age 13, or there's a juvenile complaint issued. So what happens now under the current statutory scheme? Assault and battery, age 13. He's 23. He's just been charged with an assault and battery occurring 10 years before. So I think there's no disagreement that that individual can be transferred under 72A, whether they commit the assault and battery under tw as 12 or under 16. The notion here is that it's a modern interpretation of a juvenile 1990 that instead of uh, incorporating section 61 with 72, incorporate section 54 with uh, 72A. And section 54 is what defines the process of bringing complaints or indictments against a juvenile youthful offender indictment. The youthful offender indictment is limited to 14 and 17, whereas the delinquency complaint is not so limited. Doesn't the statute of limitations shake out a lot of those, though? I, it, it could. Statute of limitations could. I mean, it, it wouldn't be applicable here where you're right. dealing with a rape charge. But right. So, so could, could I just ask you this hypothetical? So let's say you've got a 13-year-old who engages in uh, an offense. Let's say it's assault and battery. Uh, under the current statute, they could not be charged as a youthful offender. Yes, Your Honor. But let's say they're prosecuted when they're 23 years old. Let's yes, Your Honor. say they can be charged. They can be charged as a, with a complaint in with district court. With a delinquency court. complaint, but and not as a, not as in the more serious. A, under the defendant's well, argument, Yes, an indictment could not proceed after a 72A. Well, what's your position? Do you say an indictment can proceed? The Commonwealth's position here is that once a 72A hearing takes place, that the usual course of the criminal process occurs. A complaint issues in the district court. The Commonwealth has the um, discretion to either bring an indictment or not. And if they do bring an indictment, successfully bring an indictment, it goes to superior court. So, so, so then... Back to my hypothetical, mm -hmm. if you're the 13-year-old uh, and you're, uh, you're, you're charged uh, before you turn 17, you cannot be the subject of an indictment. But if the Commonwealth waits until you're, you're over 17, then you could be the subject of an indictment. Your Honor, That's in, your position. in your mass practice book, I think you suggest that there might be a due process or a constitutional issue. Yeah. And certainly, I think that might be the case if there's indication that the Commonwealth did this in bad faith, that they sort of said, mm -hmm. you know, wait, let's just wait a few day. more months. Yeah, but that, we, doesn't that seem kind of, uh, I don't know, ironic that if the Commonwealth chooses to just wait, that they could then accomplish something that they couldn't accomplish if they prosecuted the juvenile before 
he turned 17. Well, Your Honor, again, if they choose to wait, I think we get into the due process issue. Um, but, you, you know, I, I mean, I think part of the response to that is that to the extent that um, uh, this court has sort of said uh, the um, omission or the failure of the, of the legislature sort of addressed these holes, I think it would be difficult for this court to come back and, and say, you know, look, maybe they did want to protect 7- and 14-year-olds, but the fact of the matter is there's no language. I mean, I think let, me, let me ask you this. Sure. Uh, how, how, at what age could the Commonwealth prosecute a person? What if they're six years old? Uh, Your Honor, I think the defendant brought this forward in the Superior Court. I, I think the simple answer is you can't give what you don't have. Um, I, I think the, argue, the answer is no different if you sort of say the juvenile court, the Commonwealth tried to bring a complaint in juvenile court well, against well, someone who committed a crime in New Hampshire. Juvenile court can't hear that. There's no jurisdiction in the wh first where place. Where do you get that age? This becomes from the definition in 52. So you mean you couldn't bring, you, 72A has got to start with the bringing of a juvenile complaint, right? Yes, Your Honor. So the ju a juvenile complaint cannot be brought. Yes, Your Honor. Against anyone under seven years old. Or someone who committed a crime in New Hampshire. If there's no original right. jurisdiction. Um, and I, I think that that's not an issue. It's a factual matter in this case. Are yes, we really Honor. talking, if, if I understand this correctly, we're talking about four of the indictments? Uh, Your Honor, I think the first set of four unambiguously occurred when the defendant was under the age of 14, and the second set is somewhat ambiguous that it dealt with a, um, a school year instead of a calendar year, and within that school year, the defendant turned 14, so I think there would be some question of fact. Um, I, I would just like to address a couple points um, uh, that the defendant raised in argument. I think one of the things the defendant points to is this incorporation of section 52 through 84 and other statutes. And I would suggest, actually, that that really favors the Commonwealth instead of the defendant, because I think this is what the court spoke about in Vega or Bosque, which is the legislature showed it knew how to write the words sections 52 through 84. They didn't do it here. Not only did they not do it here, they used to, ha you know, they used to incorporate 53 uh, through 63, and they omitted that. Um, uh, the same issue again. Uh, the defendant uh, Sykes cites Zapata and a number of other cases talking about um, the need for um, uh, jurisdiction expansion and uh, explicit language to that effect. If you look at Zapata and those other number of cases, they're talking about grants of equitable jurisdiction to other courts, and moreover, they're talking about that before the reorganization of the district court. So at the time, we're talking about the superior court, which is, at, at the time, the only court of equitable jurisdiction. Uh, Zapata dealt with... Um, or what some of the cases dealt with an extension of uh, equitable jurisdiction to um, uh, administrative agencies. That's not what we're here. Section, uh, Section 72A always dealt with transfer of jurisdictions. It always dealt with this gap. Um, so I don't think that's an issue here. This has always been a jurisdiction transfer issue. It's not been a grant of equitable jurisdiction or, or any of the other um, applications that the defendant suggests. Um, but just the essential point here is that uh, we don't even engage in statutory interpretation unless there's ambiguity in the statute. And I, I, I can't see any ambiguity in the statute. It isn't the case where under the prior version of 61A, uh, 61 or 72A, where there are these contradictory messages, transport, but incorporate the juvenile statutes. They've excluded that. But, but you know, the, the, the interesting thing is there is such a, a, um, a, a divergence from the legislative policy uh, in, in, in against uh, the prosecution of, of people under the age of 14. Um, uh, I mean, if, what if this kid was 8 years old or 10 years old and committed an armed robbery while masked? Uh, I, the, the, he, you know, he, the, the, the legislature could not have intended that that 10-year-old kid um, would have, should be treated as an adult if he's apprehended when he's 23. I don't see why that's the case, Your Honor. Uh, I mean, I think, quite frankly, they could have done that if they wanted to. They, I mean, this court has repeatedly said that yeah. it's up to the legislature to deal with that. I, but I, I, I think you're right about that, except that wouldn't it, it is such a divergence from their policy about treating people under certain ages that they would have said it explicitly, wouldn't they? I disagree, Your Honor, and I think one of the things that Justice Ireland points out in mass practice, and I think is pretty obvious by the 1996 revision is that the legislature wanted to get serious about this, and they wanted to get serious about it because uh, 
in often cases there was gang violence where you'd give the 16-year-old the gun to go shoot someone. You'd so, give so, a young so, person the gun to go shoot, shoot someone. So why not eliminate the floor of 14? Because, and anybody who commits one of these crimes because, is going to go to the big house. Yes, Your Honor, but because the essential distinction is that when we look at the juvenile scheme, and I think 53 is what accurately displays it, is that we treat juveniles different than adults. And what Section 72A is designed to do is make people look accountable for their crimes. And whether you incorporate the victim's rights statute or anything else, the notion is that once you're 23, if you commit a crime, the Commonwealth can, can make you accountable for that. You did it back then. Well, I mean, I think whether you look at D'Urbano and a juvenile, I mean, I think this court repeatedly sort of said, you messed up. And they use the same language both times. They say 13. Uh, someone who was 13 and who's first apprehended after they're 18. The first time the legislature came in and responded to D. Urbano and gave a partial fix, and then a juvenile came in and said, you still missed the 13-year-old. The legislature came back and fixed it again. And I think, uh, again, it's, um, it's a principle of statutory interpretation that this court presumes, presumes that the legislature is aware of this, uh, of this court's decisions. And they came in and they excised the offending language that a, a juvenile in 1990 seized upon this incorporative language. They excised that after this decision. They expanded and added the sentence of usual course of criminal process. Um, I, it's very hard for me to uh, suggest or, or, or to reconcile that with the explicit argument in a juvenile that said this is the language. This is the language that creates this problem, and the legislature struck it. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor.